Okay, hi everybody. Um, thank you for attending our um, documentary screening today on the vertical border and uh, discussion with um, four panelists. I'm just going to very briefly introduce our moderator, Rebecca Galamba is trained as an anthropologist and she is an associate professor, professor at the Joseph Corbel School of International Studies at the University of Denver. She has written um, The Contraband Corridor, Making a Living at the Mexico-Guatemala Border. And this book highlights the livelihood strategies of residents living along an unmonitored border route in the context of heightened securitization. Um, and just in case anyone was wondering, the Spanish translation has recently been published of this book. Um, Rebecca has also conducted research on abuses committed against migrants in transit at the Mexico-Guatemala border. And her forthcoming book, Unjust Wa Wages, which is under contract with Stanford University Press, um, is an activist ethnography on immigrant worker justice and the struggle against wage theft in Colorado. Thank you, Rebecca. Thanks so much. Um, and welcome to the screening of the vertical border, which is directed by Sonia Wolf with photography by Maxime Duvenet and Cesar Ortiz Lopez with art by Oscar Zermenu. And just to give you a little bit of a structure of the event, um, first we'll be watching the film. This will be followed by an introduction to some of the panelists, um, then commentary from the panelists, as well as questions from the audience. So please make sure to tune into and um, be back for the conversation after you watch the film at 3.15 Eastern time. Welcome back. Um, I'll reconvene us. Um, thank you to um, Sonia Wolf for sharing this powerful film as well as ISA for hosting it. Um, I am going to briefly um, give bios of the panelists that are here to, to comment. Um, we'll have one round of comments um, from the panelists. And then if you do have questions as the audience, um, please put those in the Q&A um, and try to, if you want to address them to particular panelists, please put that there as well. Um, if not, we will pose it to the panelists more generally. And if there's time, we'll open up for more comments as well. I apologize, I have a parking dog. <laughs> um, first, I'll introduce um, Sonia Wolf, um, who holds a PhD in international politics um, from Aberystwy University, or as she told me, University of Wales, it's just fine, um, in the UK, and is an assistant professor with the Drug Policy Program at the Center for Economic Research and Teaching, or CIDE. She held research positions at the Autonomous Technological Institute of Mexico, ITAM, the National Autonomous University of Mexico, UNAM, and the Institute for Security and Democracy, in INCIDE. Her research interests focus on violence, security, and migration, especially in Mexico and Central America. She's also author of the book, Mano Dura, The Politics of Gang Control in El Salvador, published by the University of Texas Press in 2017. <laughs> <laughs> Next, we have Maxime Plouvenet um, from Toulon, France. He holds a master's in international relations from Sciences Po in Toulouse. In 2019, he joined Habesha as content creation officer. He was the director of photography for the web documentary El Dia de Mi Suerte, or My Day Will Come, that was released in Mexico in 2021, which chronicles the life of a young Honduran woman enrolled in the Migrant Protection Protocols, also often known as Remain in Mexico program in Tijuana. Since 2021, he is also a journalist with the Lebanese digital media EC Beirut. Next is Todd Miller, um, who you also heard from in the film, who is an author and independent journalist. He resides in Tucson, Arizona, and has researched and written about border issues for more than 15 years. His books include most recently, and um, you can see he draws on it in the film, um, Build Bridges, Not Walls, A Journey to a World Without Borders, published by City Lights in 2021. Um, and recently before that, Empire of Borders, The Expansion of the US Border Around the World, published by Verso in 2019. Two years before that, um, Storming the Wall, Climate Change, Migration and Homeland Security, published by City Lights in 2017. 
and then Border Patrol Nation, Dispatches from the Front Lines of Homeland Security, also published by City Life in 2014. Todd Miller writes a, a weekly post for the Border Chronicle, a weekly newsletter that publishes original, on-the-ground reporting, analysis, and commentary about the U.S.-Mexico borderlands. Then we have Juan Manuel de la Rosa, who is the legal coordinator of the U.S. Committee for Refugees and Immigrants, or USCRI, in Mexico. He holds a law degree from the Autonomous University of Aguas Calientes and a specialization in international migration from the Colegio de la Frontera Norte, or ALCOLEF. He's worked as a legal advisor on legislative and regulatory matters at the Secretary of the Interior in Mexico, or SIGL, as well as the State Human Rights Commission and the Public Defenders Institute in the Mexican state of Aguas Calientes. He has researched immigration issues, including the recognition of university degree certificates for refugees in Mexico. And I do want to apologize for my barking dog who was silent during the entire film. Um, and now I will turn it over to the panelists. Thank you very much, um, Rebecca. Well, um, so we're having this first round um, of, uh, of comments. Uh, really what we're uh, hoping to do in this event is to have uh, um, a conversation uh, with the audience. Uh, so first of all, thank you uh, to everyone who connected, um, who uh, wanted to see the film and um, uh, and discuss uh, the film with us. Uh, and also um, thank you to uh, to my fellow panelists, uh, Maxime, who is really um, the, the main person in Habesha who has worked uh, on the documentary uh, to make this possible. And also thank you to, uh, to Todd and Juan Manuel uh, for participating uh, in the uh, in the film, so I thought um, initially uh, I wanted uh, to speak briefly about why we wanted um, to do uh, this documentary, and later on, if there's time, um, perhaps uh, we could speak a little bit more about what we can do um, with this documentary now that it's um, being released. So uh, forced migration, this is something uh, that we've looked into um, before um, at the CEDIS. So uh, before even doing this documentary, um, we studied um, forced migration uh, and produced some materials um, on, the, on the subject uh, already, but we wanted to take this um, a little further. Um, essentially bring this uh, to a larger audience and also in a uh, in a different uh, format. But perhaps the, um, the two main points that we wanted to emphasize uh, in the film uh, are on the one hand uh, forced migration itself um, and the other point is uh, the vertical border. Yeah, so perhaps um, we have two um, uh, perhaps quite uh, quite complex um, ideas. Yeah. So uh, first of all, when we talk about um, migration, migration is uh, itself quite a quite a broad concept. And so when we when we look at why people are leaving uh, their their communities and their countries. Uh, there are different uh, labels that over time have been uh, applied to people. So we might describe um, people as internally displaced persons. Uh, we also have refugees uh, and asylum seekers, and even UNHCR has tried uh, to broaden um, these categories a little in order to, um, to be able to respond to the needs of a, of a larger uh, population. Um, but I think there's still this tendency to to distinguish between migrants who, who seem to be leaving their countries voluntarily and other people who are um, forcibly displaced, whether it's within the borders of the country or across um, uh, international borders. And so when we emphasize uh, that this is not a film just about migration, but about forced migration, um, we wanted to, um, to go a little bit deeper into why it is that the people are leaving their countries, because uh, a lot of the time we are seeing um, migrants in, in the news, but we don't, um, we don't hear uh, perhaps enough about why, why they're leaving and why they should be considered um, forced migrants. So forced migration uh, is really a uh, a global issue, but uh, as you will have seen, the documentary focuses uh, especially on uh, on people leaving Central America uh, who are headed towards uh, Mexico and the United States. So why uh, should we be talking about um, Central Americans uh, in terms of forced migrants? Um, you will have seen 
at the beginning of the documentary that um, uh, the situation in, in Central America continues to be uh, difficult, and this uh, this helps explain why why people feel compelled um, to leave their countries. Um, but when we look at countries such as uh, El Salvador and, and Honduras, perhaps it is the, uh, the physical violence that comes to mind, especially gang violence, also um, organized crime. But this doesn't explain really um, everything that people uh, have to go through in Central America. So, of course, people's um, experiences are, uh, are quite different, but we can see that there are overlaps in, in people's uh, experiences. So, of course, we can say that um, the physical violence that people are experiencing in their communities uh, is, is one important reason why people feel uh, they need to uh, go to Mexico, perhaps, or to the United States. But another important reason is what we might call uh, structural violence. And this is um, perhaps uh, a little harder to sell because um, one might think uh, that people are uh, uh, going to Mexico or especially the United States because they're looking uh, for better economic opportunities or perhaps because they're, they're chasing the so-called American dream. Um, but if we think of these uh, migrants as as voluntary migrants or just economic migrants, uh, I think this does not really capture the, uh, the gravity of the situation uh, in Central America. So by emphasizing that this is forced migration, we really wanted um, to emphasize how, how serious um, um, or how, how difficult the conditions are for many people in Central America and that these um, conditions really uh, um, make people think that uh, that there is no alternative to, to migration. Um, and so this is, um, as I said, one point we wanted to, to emphasize uh, in the documentary show um, why it's important to, um, to emphasize the, the context and the constraints that people are, are experiencing uh, in their lives. And the other part uh, has to do uh, uh, with what we call uh, the vertical border uh, in the film. So uh, again, perhaps um, you might say that uh, the, the situation of violence and the crisis of human rights in Mexico is not new as such. Uh, even the abuses that migrants are experiencing have been uh, documented um, before. But when we talk about uh, the vertical border, we wanted to draw attention to more than uh, migration controls. Uh, you will see in the documentary that there are um, different um, actors, uh, the non-state actors are more hidden, but we certainly see uh, state actors. Uh, for example, the, the National Migration Institute, we also hear about Mexico's refugee agency. And of course, there are also soldiers and especially uh, the National Guard uh, that was uh, created uh, by the current president and that is also now playing a role in, in migration controls. So again, when we, um, when we talk about migration, perhaps instinctively, we think more about this formal migration uh, control apparatus, uh, especially the, the Migration uh, Institute. Um, but uh, I, I think we have to, uh, to broaden uh, our look at Mexico uh, a little and to see that uh, really the obstacles that migrants are facing uh, relate not only to the migration controls or migration practices that Mexico is implementing, but also to the effects uh, of the so-called drug war that uh, was first launched in, in 2006. And so we have seen uh, over time that really uh, the situation for migrants has become um, much more difficult in part uh, because of the, the violence that is playing out, uh, not just uh, between criminal groups, but also between criminal groups uh, and the state uh, itself. And so this violence that is associated uh, with this war has affected not only Mexican citizens, but also um, migrants, but of course for migrants um, who are in the country, uh, uh, without authorization or even for, for their families who are still in Central America, it is very difficult to obtain a redress or some sort of, some sort of uh, justice for the, for the abuses that have been committed uh, against migrants. So I think um, uh, I leave it uh, here just uh, perhaps for, for further reflection also for the discussion. Um, 
uh, you might think that the the focus in the documentary is on on Mexico, but really what we see is um, uh, all of this connecting, not just in, in terms of of issues, but also um, that the, the the countries Central America, uh, Mexico, and the United States uh, are linked uh, really through this this vertical border. Yeah, so um, we might think that. Perhaps the, uh, the the root of all this is uh, in Central America, where where people are leaving. But I think we also need to recognize that this vertical border uh, is operating because uh, of what the, the United States is trying to do uh, in the region. So this deterrence strategy uh, really operates through this vertical border um, that we have looked at in in Mexico. Thank you. Maxime? Yes, thank you. Thank you to ISA to let us a space. Um, really, I will not uh, add that much. I'm waiting for the question, maybe on more about the process of making the documentary, just highlighting uh, the fact, like we're taking uh, Sonia's word on uh, that it's not only about migration, and um, highlighting the fact that maybe you saw in the documentary that there were not many migrants uh, or refugees uh, interviewed. That's a reason, no? We wanted to focus on the process, the complex process of what we call the vertical border, which is much more than the wall, for example, which is uh, the most maybe visible part of uh, how the United States is during migration. But we begin the documentary, that's why we begin in Central America, much more at the South, because maybe um, just highlighting one, one event when we were uh, shooting the documentary, reaching Arizona. Uh, at that time, uh, there were a real focus from the US media, for example, on the US southern border because of the uh, 10,000, 15,000 Haitians uh, blocked in uh, Del Rio, uh, between Ciudad Acuna and Del Rio. And uh, really, it was, it was, uh, I remember I was actually in Phoenix uh, waiting for my bus to see Todd in uh, Tucson. And I saw how the US media were focusing on, on the national security issue of the thousand border. But at, 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 uh, at, um, it, at any moment they were mentioning, for example, the, the dramatic situation from Chiapas, which was occurring one month. Uh, earlier from that uh, event, and uh, uh, it showed us when, while we were shooting the documentary, how maybe the U.S. audience sometimes is not aware of the root causes of that migration, and uh, if they are not aware of these root causes, uh, much less they will be aware of how the 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 whole strategy is to block to deter this migration at at the southern border, like. Obviously, as uh, Frey Gabriel says it in uh, Tenosique, uh, the wall and the, the northern border of Mexico and Tijuana and all this space, of course, there is repression and there is a uh, deterrence uh, strategy, but the deterrence is much more at the south now uh, through, of course, migration controls, uh, the migration, uh, Mexican migration apparatus, but also things such as uh, ads advertisement, as you may see, for example, in the San Pedro Sula scene in Honduras, you may see in uh, San Pedro Sula this advertisement from the IOM saying that uh, at any time they could uh, pay their, their flight back uh, before even uh, their departure, uh, forced departure from Honduras. So uh, the vertical border, it's all these elements uh, from soft power to art power that we wanted to highlight. and. Um, and uh, I will stay uh, here to, to to maybe discuss on the making of uh, the documentary, or even to discuss much more about the solutions uh, which uh, Todd uh, actually presented uh, in the long discussion we had when we made the interview. And of course, because of the selection, it's only a part of the reflection showed uh, at the end of the documentary. But I really hope we could we could discuss that here. Thank you. Okay, I'll turn over to Tan Miller next. Hi, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for this. Uh, thanks, Rebecca and Sonia and Maxime. Um, it's, uh, it was really an honor to be able to participate and be a part of this, this uh, film. Um, and I have to say, I thought it was sweeping, like as Maxime Maxime just just mentioned uh, 
so often in the United States, the our uh, awareness of the border, right? It ends at the border, right? It doesn't go any further. And um, so the vertical uh, border part of it and how it starts, um, where it starts with Oscar Martinez and El Salvador, um, I thought it was really incredible. And, and those, I, oh, I should mention too, before I continue the, the, um, also the cinematography, um, I thought was beautiful and the music was, was really uh, moving, you know, and it really, I thought wove, you, you know, from one place to the other really well. Um, and that the idea, like looking at the two, um, two major themes of the movie, uh, the forced migration part of it, like starting with Oscar Martinez and in El Salvador and getting that um, historic context was just so, it was to, to, to buy it to the violence in El Salvador, for example, it was, it's just, so it's, it gives that rich context that so often is lacking um, in many like media accounts of what's going on in the, in Central America or and how it's portrayed to the public in the United States. So I'm looking from the U.S. public point of view. And so having those historic, you know, linkages and giving that context and understanding and unpacking the, vi the violence and understanding the historical nature and the civil war in El Salvador and, you know, the different things all the way to the La Mat Mat Matan Matanza or Matanza, sorry, um, from 1932 in El Salvador, just understanding the the whole history of it, I think, was just invaluable. And also, you know, other parts of force of the forced migration, like going into Honduras and understanding, you know, the neoliberal economic model, and how, like as Sonia mentioned, um, how so many things, you know, there's there's so many things playing into each other, like so many different factors that are interrelate. And um, Berta Cáceres and the extractivism. And um, under and seeing like the kind of resistance that's that's happening, so I just I just really I really appreciated you know that sort of overview and the historic context that was given um, on one side to the to looking at at the idea of forced migration, and then on the other hand you know the vertical border, um, you know like like I thought you know there's a lot of things that I learned really. Um, from this movie, and excuse my voice, I've um, <clears throat> been suffering a cold, <laughs> so so I my my voice has been a little bit iffy for the last couple of days. But um, the the I you know like giving the the extra context of the drug war, for example, and and how it plays out in Mexico, um, to the vertical border, I thought it was just really um excellent analysis, and I immediately thought of the Merida Initiative, right the the multi-billion dollar um, U.S. Uh, military assistance plan that was from 2008, which was under the context of the drug war. And then, of course, in its evolutions, I think it has a new name now. I think it's been renamed something else. But um, if the third pillar became, you know, creating a 21st century border in Mexico. So, you know, the, the idea of that, those two things coming together, I thought, was very, really, really poignant analysis and very um, informative and and actually critical to understanding what the border is, how like, and again, from a US perspective, how we're often thought that the border is one thing, the US-Mexico border, but it's really much bigger, much more expansive, um, going many places, it's vertical, <laughs> like you exactly how you put it. So the, I mean, those are my first impressions. This is my first time watching it right now so these are just kind of my immediate pers um impressions but i was but i i thought it was it was great and i again i just want to stress the cinematography i thought was was just really sweeping so thank you and um then we'll go to juan manuel de la rosa hi everyone uh first of all i just would like to say that uh, well it's an honor to be part of this panel and also it was it was really amazing to be part of of this documentary 
as uh, Todd said, I think it's it's amazing. The cinematography, it's beautiful. I think it really highlights um, what really happens. You know, I have been here in the border. Uh, well, it, this office of UCRI in Mexico has been open for over a year. And I think uh, everything that you saw on the documentary, at least going until Tijuana or the Mexican border with the U.S., you can um, witness it as the people tells you all the stories, you know, how they come from Honduras, El Salvador, how they were victims of uh, uh, of violence by the Mexican authorities and also how the United States are not uh, like, yeah, they're building walls that are not just physical, but also they're not letting anyone having some sort of uh, options of legal options to, to cross and ask for any kind of help. No, So um, to me, it was really it was really interesting and I think it really highlights this vertical border, as they said. No, I, I would like to maybe share something that I that I wrote. Uh, and, and well, uh, just I will I will be reading it really shortly. So um, so well, as you know, well, UNHCR I, uh, last year they said there were like around 84 million people displaced in the world, and uh, these people were moving because of crises, because of wars, because of internal conflicts, because of climate change. So the the idea of as as Sonja said, the idea of migrants, of economic and in displaced people have been really moving and it's really important to acknowledge the the profile of these people because they have different needs you know and you cannot say it as they were the same as how maybe they were treated before it, it's necessary to start changing the narrative of around these people and um and as long as i've been here it it has been quite under uh, interesting and also this it's been for the people that has been here and that comes to my office to understand that um Right now, for example, as long as since the implementation of MPP in 2019 until 2021, when it went finished, and then it was reinstated in late 2021, and how it's not there is basically no information of where, for example, uh, who is um, it's super discretional how people can roll into these programs, but also adding to that the Title 42, who for uh, pandemic uh, issues, uh, people weren't could not enter even in a maybe undocumented way and then ask for asylum there. They couldn't even have that possible out, uh, well, outlet or inlet to join, to, to ask for asylum. So they were without any kind of help with, uh, with any kind of legal help, which kind of uh, lead to uh, fraud, misinformation for people here, trafficking also. There were a lot of people who were uh, stranded and they ask for any kind of help. It doesn't matter where it came from. And we here in our office, we we hear lots of cases of that sort. We even had some uh, beneficiaries who were victims of uh, maybe not in a really harsh way, but they were from extortion as well because they were asking for any kind of aid or support and they didn't have it. And also Mexican, um, Mexican, as you see, as you saw, we have being witness of how Mexican authorities migration and also army have been really just instead of uh, asking and wondering what are the needs with, what are the needs with these people it's they're not uh, they're not being kind of uh, they are not kind of understanding the needs of these people and also trying to understand that for example last year in Mexico was the biggest year with requests for asylum seekers in Mexico well, refugee protection it was around 131,000 uh, people so there was no there's actually no um there there hasn't been a lot of changes to attend all of these requests so that makes another like struggle for these people and and I and maybe what's really interesting from my part, is, and is that this is actually really funny because um, funny in a way that I was talking about this exact same topic with a fellow uh, NGO and we were asking, how, what does it mean to be a migrant or uh, nowadays, it, at least here in Tijuana, who is trying to move forward, but you cannot go backwards, but also Mexican authorities, it's not looking into what you can do or they're not trying to provide you any kind of help. So it, it must be really stressful and it must be really, and there's a lot of cases who have of people who have anxiety, depression. Uh, there are a lot of families that are here together and they have diseases and cannot be treated. And also, I mean, I think they're being not, they're not being, there hasn't been a politic about uh, doing visible 
all of this uh, community and it's amazing that there's uh, a docu series like this or the documentary that provides this uh, this the information and also explain explain and expresses what they go through so that you know we can start a dialogue about where should we start or how we should we how should we direct our our dialogue for these people or the needs or the issues or how should we take on to all of these problems no so um yeah well after that <laughs> long speech i was just trying i would like to say i'm uh, thanks for inviting me for for this panel Thank you. Um, if you can please put some questions into the Q&A for our panelists, um, maybe I'll give a couple of minutes um, to round up a first round of questions. And if not, I also have a few questions I'd love to ask the panelists as well. I actually have a question if, if that's okay. Um, so, I am wondering um, basically about the people that you interviewed and whether that posed any risks to them, especially if they were in, in Mexico or, or working for, for certain organizations and um, what, what steps that you mm -hmm. took to, to try and um, alleviate that situation. Um, you speak about the two people, uh, the two migrants interviewed uh, in the documentary? Yes. Well, uh, at that time when we were in Tapachula, which was the city where, where we interviewed uh, Isaias and Evelyn, as I called them in the documentary, um, actually they were quite, it was quite interesting to, to have their point of view because both of them uh, had already tried to, to migrate to Mexico in the, the past years, no? In particular, Evelyn, her first trip, she told me it was in 2009 when she was still uh, a child. And uh, so she already knew the beast. She could see uh, the evolution of the, of the track. So, so their point of view were invaluable. Um, and for protection, uh, in this case, they were uh, both asking asylum in uh, Mexico at the time where we made the, the interview. Um, we convened that uh, we, we would not directly uh, shoot their faces, although uh, obviously just with the mask, we could recognize them. Um, it was a, a question we asked ourselves about the confidentiality and anonymity. Uh, and often it's actually an interesting uh, debate, which I think should happen at every moment, at every uh, work now about, should we show the faces? Obviously a journalist would say, I want faces, I need faces, and a humanitarian would say, I would first uh, make protection. Um, and uh, and after speaking re really in depth with, uh, with, with both of them now, with Evelyn and Isaias, we, we came to the conclusion both that they were not directly in need of protection i mean in, they were in need of protection in mexico but they were not persecuted in mexico so they were not afraid of both sharing their faces and their stories um just to comment that afterwards to show how the decisions uh can change uh because of the despair of being of waiting no, in, Me in, in mexico uh two months after the interview they decided to cross uh, the state of Chiapas, which, as mentioned in the documentary, it's considered uh, considered as an abandon to their uh, to their request. And here also we show uh, another effect of the vertical border. Now that how the despair, uh, the 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 fact of waiting of despair is really pretty much part of the strategy. Also has the deterrence and through uh, the. Um, uh, prevention through the deterrence strategy had it about the fact that circumvents the places and go to much more dangerous places. The vertical border also has this effect about hoping that because of the waiting, the long months of waiting, uh, people would despair. But people don't despair. I mean, they got the spirit, but they they cannot go back home. And that's why the, this whole system doesn't understand and highlight that they are. Uh, uh, fleeing from their countries because of forced and structural violence. So it's not like an option to come back. 
um, even when we see the, the, the numbers, for example, of voluntary return, no, which is a program of IOM to finance uh, some uh, migrants who would be desperate and wanted to go back voluntarily, there are very few numbers. And I'm not sure about the fact that all these experience of uh, voluntary return are uh, successful. But um, so, yeah, to, man to come back to your question, like we, we discussed with them directly. And because of the situation at that time, because they were asking asylum in Mexico, they didn't feel persecuted, uh, they agreed to share their uh, testimonies. But as I said, uh, be between the time of shooting the interview and editing the documentary, many things happened. No? Uh, maybe it would be uh, the occasion in uh, another question to mention that many facts in the documentary changed while we edited it now, such as, for example, ex uh, Honduran president uh, Juan Orlando Hernandez, which is uh, maybe a good uh, a good um, highlight, not to 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 show how the institutions are not maybe working in in these countries and that they cannot wait uh, help from the institutions if the president itself was. Uh, put on drug uh, charges you know, by the U.S. Treasury. Um, I'd love to ask a question um, that sort of brings together the three themes that I think were raised by the film, as well as I think that Sonia laid out so nicely for us, this idea of the vertical border, um, the terminology of forced displacement and the rhetoric, um, as well as the previous question about kind of how the film will be disseminated and how even the strategy of filming a film that could cross borders as seamlessly as was done in the film can sort of then build this kind of solidarity or um, audiences to kind of push back on this. And, you know, I saw three things with a few things with the verticality and, and I'm interested a little bit about the term um, vertical border. And again, this kind of expanding what we see at the border is not just fencing as, you know, Todd mentioned the, the virtual technologies or Juan mentioned these kind of bureaucratic borders, um, euphemistic borders that are put up such as protection protocols. Um, and I guess I had a question more related to, you know, to way this terminology can get us the ways that the border has not only been exported outward to the United States, um, but become more diffuse, um, sometimes menace inward, um, including within the United States um, itself, um, even after migrants arrive, um, as well as historically. And um, I was also curious how you incorporate the historical um, structural um, roots of these issues that you mentioned in the film to this idea of vertical bordering. And I think, you know, Todd brings up this concept of border imperialism, right? And so do we date the vertical border back to the very kind of open borders that the United Fruit Company or the CIA or the US State Department has experienced in its own actions abroad um, as part of that concept of um, the vertical border, I think would be interesting um, to think with. Um, a little bit more. Um, similarly, these kind of euphemisms I thought were really interesting, um, the terminology we use, um, the idea of a crisis. I know Todd brings that up um, in the film. And I know this is a question um, that I've seen a lot on circulating um, on Twitter um, and other conferences and like th this whole rhetoric of, of forced displacement, right? And how um, we really question what, what we're using to talk about the reasons people are fleeing, recognizing that these terms are often used to disqualify deservingness for the majority of people. Um, and the question we often see now is how Ukrainian refugees, for example, um, are being welcomed in contrast to Syrians, to Afghans, to Central Americans. Um, I saw scholar Lemmy's um, Abdelati talk about this idea that when we talk about crisis now and refugee crisis with Ukraine, we, we, we rightly locate that crisis to Ukraine versus when we talk about the European refugee crisis or the Central American refugee crisis, it locates that as a crisis for Europe, for the United States. And kind of how do we think about these euphemisms and the work um, that they're doing and that extends to, again, you know, what, um, what are the plans to disseminate this film in Central America, um, in Mexico and other in the United States? And how could this film be part of a way of, of pushing back or resisting these dynamics of the vertical border? Thank you, Rebecca. Um, well, <laughs> you've raised uh, many points and um, perhaps I will, I will um, take up two and then perhaps uh, my, my fellow panelists uh, would like to to add something. So perhaps if I um, 
if I start with the uh, with the beginning of the documentary, you mentioned uh, the, the historical uh, context, and I think um, bringing in this context uh, was important because um, uh, it, it allows us to show that um, in, in all this uh, this crisis narrative, there's this idea that something new is happening, something unprecedented, something uh, unexpected, and we need to respond to it now. And this is what leads us to. Um, uh, to, to the wrong approaches, yeah. So when, when there's suddenly a humanitarian crisis or a border crisis, it brings in a lot of the time uh, emergency responses, not uh, more uh, more considered uh, policy strategies, really. Uh, and also when we talk about uh, the historical context um, in the film, it also allows us to show uh, perhaps a little bit more the role of the United States. So the United States is not a country that... Um, uh, as Trump said, is, is being uh, invaded by, by large numbers uh, of migrants that is simply at the receiving end uh, of this crisis. But it's a country that um, for a long time has played uh, a role in the instability uh, that uh, the Central American countries have been uh, experiencing. So by, by, by bringing out this historical context, um, I hope we can show that the, the, the two ends are really uh, connecting, Yeah, so that um, uh, it is really uh hypocritical uh, in a sense on on the part of the united states um to not to acknowledge the role it has played uh, in in central america and then when when people are being um displaced and they're they're looking for assistance and uh, and international protection um uh, richer countries such as the united states close their doors uh to these people yeah so this is why i think the the historical context uh, was important. In terms of uh, of concepts, I think it is uh, it is easy for anyone to feel overwhelmed uh, when we look at um, at policy discussions, also at uh, at the academic literature that is out there. I mean, there's an abundance uh, of of concepts, and of course. Um, People are, are trying to to understand better what, what is happening, but this uh, this has led really to a proliferation of concepts. How to think, as you said, how to think about uh, the border or borders. What is happening? Uh, where is uh, the border spreading? Is it something horizontal or something vertical? Is it reaching into Central America or perhaps also into the interior of the United States? Uh, and on the other hand, we have um, uh, many concepts that, that try to to describe who the, the migrants are, yeah, what what their intentions are, what kind of uh, responses should be required uh, to their uh, situation. Uh, and perhaps if I can link this um, to uh, to another point you, you briefly raised, dissemination, what to do with this documentary. Um, I think especially when we look uh, at the concepts, um, I thought it was important uh, to keep this simple, yeah, because this is not, um, even though it's based on, on academic research, uh, inspired by it, we wanted um, to create something um, that is really um, accessible for anyone and that can encourage a broader discussion. So if we bring in too many concepts, if we make this very technical, people may not perhaps um, be very receptive uh, to, to our message. So I thought it was important uh, to keep this uh, simple and not to, to bring in too many concepts. Uh, and uh, it, I mean, it would be a, a very long film if we wanted to discuss all the, the concepts um, that are out there. So this is really um, uh, our, uh, our proposal. Uh, really to to contribute to uh, to the conversations that that are already out there, but hopefully to uh, to bring in some 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 more clarity and also to encourage people um, to uh, to watch the documentary and and discuss it. Yeah, and perhaps we can come back to this later on. But I think this uh, hopefully will be one of the main. Um, conclusions for people that really it is it is up to uh, to all of us yeah if, if we want to if we want to see a social change or more adequate responses to um, uh, to forced migration or migration um, generally um, then uh, we all need to join this this conversation and really um, see this as a as a first uh, first step uh, and I think um, 
there is um, Sarah's uh, question that is uh, in the chat about advice for policymakers. So I will just briefly reiterate um, what I just said. Um, in terms of, um, I think with the documentary is the question of, of packaging the story in a, in a different way. We did not uh, want to treat it uh, like an academic document where we make some policy recommendations um, because for me, me really what um um how how all this started um why i was i was interested in uh, in a documentary film is really this dilemma that i think we often face in in academia there is uh, lots of research evidence there are also policy recommendations but a lot of the time studies and policy recommendations do not get taken uh, into account so what what i see as the problem is not the lack of of research evidence or uh, perhaps um disinterest on the part of uh, of researchers to to engage with policymakers not at all but i think policy making uh, is very often shaped by by politics and politics prevents uh, policymakers from uh, from pondering perhaps more the, the strategies they should be implementing. Um, so in terms of um, a specific advice for policymakers, um, I think the, the uh, I, I would not even want to, to get near uh, this idea of advice for policymakers insofar as the documentary is concerned. Uh, I would like to consider it um, a tool for education and for for discussion uh, that I would like many people to uh, to take advantage of. So rather than making specific uh, policy um, recommendations with this documentary, what I really would like um, to do is to encourage people to uh, to watch the the documentary, to share it, and to and to discuss it. And I think this really should be the uh, the the starting point for uh, perhaps for for more specific um, organizing in terms of advocacy, but also for for policy recommendations that can be implemented. Would any of the other panelists like to comment on either of the discuss of the questions posed? Um, we don't have any questions in the chat right now. If I may, just um, I'm sorry, Juan. Um, just mentioning uh, something more about what said uh, Sonja and uh, the solutions. Um, saying that about you mentioned the Ukrainian or the European context. No, uh, in a moment. Uh, this documentary could have been made in Europe, in Hungary, in Libya, uh, in, uh, in Turkey, um, in other parts of the world where the, the problem, the issue is the same. No, we, we saw it with uh, David Scott Fitzgerald reminding that it's a global issue, a global strategy from the, uh, the northern countries, the global north, blocking this migration. Uh, and uh, about introducing the, the, the subject of solutions, of course, we cannot think about individual solutions. As citizens, of course, we may have an opinion about the subject. Uh, and of course, these kind of documentaries are here to, to, to create no, an opinion and, and a call to action. However, it cannot be individual because um, I think about one of Dot's book, uh, Build Bridges, Not Walls, which treat at the very beginning about this subject. Um, if you're an individual as a US citizen or European citizen, for example, in the case of the US, you see a migrant dying uh, of uh, thirst in the desert and you try to pick him up to, to bring him to the nearest city, it's a federal, you can be charged with a federal crime. No? In France, if you help a, a migrant uh, dying in the, the mountains of the Alps or in Calais, uh, you may be charged also, uh, maybe not with jail, but with, uh, with, with money. No? So it's called crime of solidarity in France. No, it's, uh, we, we, are, we reached that that's kind of, of oxymoron, no? crime of solidarity. Uh, so of course it cannot be individual solutions. Uh, we, we, we might think about uh, institutional solutions, no? which, which not necessarily include policymakers because uh, for example, I work uh, in a, in a, in a Mexi uh, Mexican uh, NGO from the civil society, which is a uh, Habesha shown in the documentary. 
uh, which to be honest and to be critical do not make only uh, out of promotion of course it's included in the broader political goals of the us to finance the asylum system and uh, the civil society initiatives in mexico so they don't reach the us now it can be seen this way uh, we can be honest about that but uh, we are trying uh, to to react uh, about the situations uh, also juan manuel it can be a, a better uh, a better witness of that from uh, the, the northern Mexican border every day is is adapting to the few possibilities, few legal possibilities that the U.S. can let to the migrants. No, uh, there is MPP, there is Title 42, but there is this tiny little line that per, that can help uh, maybe to 10 migrants out of uh, 100 to to cross the border. No, so I, I would like to say we could see like individually no the solution like it's it could be an individual call to action uh through uh, donation working in ngo making uh, awareness uh, but it's not only uh, uh it's, it's not possible as a, an individual uh solution because actually the vertical border itself includes the repression of the individual solutions we could make helping a migrant or refugee if we know one no so that, that was something I wanted to, to highlight from, from uh, the marvelous and amazing lecture I made from uh, Todd's book, uh, Build Bridges, Not Walls, which could be also uh, a point uh, to the link to the documentary to find solutions. No? We'll go to Juan Manuel. Thank you. Yeah, from my part, I, I think, uh, first of all, uh, for, for, I mean, <laughs> obviously, I. I don't work at politics, so I could not uh, give like a proper answer to like, how could we, but uh, from my point of view, from what I have been facing here at the border, I think it, it will be really important, one, to, to acknowledge the needs of these people, you know, it's like, uh, there are a lot of, they're mobilizing, and I think it's important about when you talk about like displacement, to talk about not mobilizing just as a not just as a uh, man or women who are like on a productive age or maybe they are like older people or children so you cannot uh, um so, so children are in a different i mean they're the groups that change the profile change so you have to be more on the on the needs of these people which it will be more more in, important to tend to and the second of all i think it will be a really cool a really good if you could have more transparent or more legal pathways for people to access to everything, you know, I think here, even with Mexico and of course in the U S with the border closed, I think it has been a really like harsh topic to just like to find out solutions or legal solutions for people, any from here or there, because sometimes they do have answers. Well, sometimes there's a pathway, but sometimes maybe there's, there's not like capacity of the institution to attend to these needs, or maybe there is, but they don't want to attend to it. Or maybe, um, there, there's no, there's no existing, uh, information regarding any programs, for example, MPP, uh, for this re-implementation, what we have been facing is there is not a solid uh, information regarding of on how it's working only the reports dhs is providing to the people or maybe like the reports or the monitoring people elsewhere are doing but there's nothing more and and people uh, asking for more help or for more info there's there's not so there's a lot of discretion when you talk about migration at least in mexico and the us and both of them have given us uh, a lot of i mean me and well, this organization, as all of the other organizations that I know here in Tijuana, have uh, provided a lot of uh, challenges, I guess, to just try to find out a solution for the problems they're presenting or the or the needs they require. There is no pathways to provide lots of things. I understand the people control their inflows and outflows, but I think they, there should be more like structured and more business visual if, uh, visual pathways for people to know what to do ask for if they are candidates or if they can do any or that so they could plan uh, their migration project you know i think you both bring out really interesting tensions that we see towards especially the end of the documentary you know between these really desires to revise unjust systems and you know create something and envision something new as as todd talks about with recognizing the very real 
realities of helping people in the predicaments that they're in um, and ways to provide perhaps some solutions in the meantime um, within those. Um, I want to just take the last few minutes to ask um, Todd or Sonia um, if they had anything that they would like to um, close with. And thank you again. Perhaps Todd, if you want to go first. Sure, uh, just just um, briefly, um, I think I think I'm, we're hearing all kinds of great things and ideas from everyone. So I really appreciate that. Um, one, one thing I always think about when, uh, um, and Rebecca, I think you mentioned this in your, your commentary earlier, um, when like the, op you know, if you say open borders or s something like that, um, the, the immediate thought is, oh, the, the you know, the border apparatus and, and, um, people coming to the border, people, often from forced migrations coming to the border, arriving to the U.S. border. And very rarely is it uh, is the idea that there's already an open border system in place um, that that um, there's a whole set of people and so a whole set of power dynamics and circumstances and capital that can go over the border without any sort of restrictions at all. There's no no impediment to it. Um, and I think those issues are highlighted very clearly in, in in the in the vertical border right the you know from the deport you know even deportation crosses borders without you know being stopped so like when at, in el salvador when when gang members from southern california were deported um you know or the kind of you know the the his the like her they mentioned hurricane mitch you know um, the idea of Matt, you know, these sorts of events, and you could even look at the hur the back to back hurricanes that happened in Central America a year year or so ago, um, which caused incredible amounts of displacement, and and then when you know when 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 a, when I think it was of like eight thousand Hondurans crossed the border from from Honduras into Guatemala, they were met by. Um, a blockade of U.S. trained um, police and military uh, who blockaded a road um, in Guatemala. So the vertical border, right? You have these elements of these of the of the vertical border and these kind of elements of forced displacement. But the the sort of you know the sort of thing of open borders of what can cross borders, like the extractivism, like companies can. Can go can fly over borders at thirty five thousand feet and do whatever it is you know the the way that certain agreements have been have been made so if you're a company you can go wherever you want and do whatever you want take whatever you want and pollute whatever you want for example and so so these so so I think there's a tension there I don't know I'm not like pointing to a solution but I think there's a tension there that points to and the, from the United States point of view, this the whole border border issues and and um and, and immigration issues are often thought of as domestic. They're put in a domestic context, and that's like wrong, right? You know, in this documentary, in this film, in this film, um, it's I, you know, I think a huge part of the solution is in. in what it would be cross international, like viewing it from an international perspective. And then the natural inclination that I see is a sort of cross cross border international solidarity that got, you know, bringing together of, um, you know, people across borders to be, to be, you know, discussing, talking like we're doing right now, talking about issues. And then, you know, I think, the the great thing it seems like there will be many organic conversations that could come from this i'll let sonia close this out okay oh, thank there's you one, there's one um question sorry perhaps you want to answer because i think it'd be it, it's a great question for you um is how can an individual or a university purchase access to the documentary and then if there's anything you'd like to close this out with sure okay so i'll include this in my uh in my final comments um Perhaps um, I'd like to uh, to end with um, with two thoughts. Um, 
Um, and they really they revolve around um, how to um, how to bring this to policymakers, but also um, ultimately what to do with this with this documentary. Um, I think uh, perhaps a lot of the time when we when we think about um, policy recommendations, we, we get um, into into specific details, and of course we, we need to think about. Um, Particular measures such as the the MPP um, program that was mentioned in the in the documentary and how to um, how to provide uh, really uh, solutions if there are solutions or at least responses to, to different um, parts of the of the migrant um, population. As Juan Manuel said, um, people have uh, they come from from different experiences and they have um, different needs. But I think, uh, at least for the purposes of the documentary, I would like us to move a little bit away from from a specific um, policy measures uh, and think about the idea that um, when we when we think about the root causes uh, of forced migration, um, we're really talking about a, a series of, of complex problems and that are interrelated and that perhaps might make us think that the, the situation is very difficult uh, to tackle. And perhaps this in turn leads many people to, to focus on specific um, policy measures because um, thinking in terms of, of structural issues and how we might respond to them just um, seems too overwhelming. But I would uh, like to emphasize that actually these structural transformations is what is needed if we really want to provide um, a, a more um, tangible and more comprehensive response uh, to forced migration. So if we avoid talking about uh, the, the structural transformations that are needed, we're, we're never uh, going to get there. We're just going to stay um, at the surface. So related to that, um, I think one of my um, main points really is uh, that I would like people to, to engage with this documentary. Of course, we would like it to be uh, watched by, by many individuals, including policymakers, uh, also um, members of Congress, uh, especially in the United States. It seems to me it would be very important uh, for people there um, to watch the, uh, the, the documentary and see how they can um, exert pressure on, uh, on the US government, but also on, on members um, uh, of Congress. So in terms of um, what to do with this documentary, uh, I think fundamentally um, what this is about, as Maxime said, it, it can serve as a as a call to action, uh, but first of all, perhaps a call uh, for, uh, for reflection uh, and debate. So hopefully people will feel that the documentary offers them a different way of, of viewing uh, forced migration, of finding out a little bit more about who the, the individuals are who are leaving Central American countries uh, in this case. Uh, and hopefully um, in, this, in this more indirect way, when, when people perhaps feel um, better informed about forced migration, we can have also more informed debates and ultimately greater pressure on policymakers to implement uh, different uh, different strategies. And so just uh, briefly to respond to the, uh, the last question in the chat, um, since we would like this documentary to be an educational tool, there's no cost uh, associated um, with the documentary. It does not need to be um, purchased and there's no, no cost uh, for screening. So uh, throughout March, uh, we will have a, a number of virtual uh, screenings and Q&As, uh, such as this one, because we would like to engage uh, with, the, with the audiences. Um, but um, uh, from April onwards, really, the documentary will be available uh, publicly. We're creating uh, a platform where the, the documentary uh, will be um, hosted uh, indefinitely. So anyone who would like to see it, um, and we are perhaps uh, especially encouraging um, uh, anyone who, who studies or who works uh, at the university, also in schools, um, members of film clubs uh, to organize their own uh, screenings and to, to sit down and, and discuss uh, the documentary. So there's no, uh, no cost associated with this. Thank you all for your time today and, and um, for 
your thoughtful responses to the questions. Um, and we hope that this is the start of many future great viewings. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing the film. Thank you so much, Thank everyone. You. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.